good morning on this beautiful, bright day. It's great to have some sunshine, even though it's a bit chilly out there. It won't stay that way forever. So glad you're here, and uh, whether you're online watching this morning or those of you that are here this morning, we bring you greetings in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our hope, our joy, our gladness. I want to call your attention to a couple of things real quickly. Just a reminder that if you need to be in touch with us, um, we encourage you to use the church email, uh, fairburyumc at gmail.com. Or uh, I know you can go on Facebook and get in connection with us as well, or church website. And uh, coming up this week, there are a few things we want to call your attention to. We'll be... Uh, gathering for uh, Pastor Parish Relations this Tuesday evening, and then on Wednesday we'll be having a wake and, and confirmation. And next Sunday is Valentine's Day, Transfiguration Sunday, uh, and as that probably brings to mind, that means we'll be beginning Lent on the 17th, Ash Wednesday. So we encourage you to be Preparing, there are some uh, Lenten materials in the fellowship hall on a table that have been put out there. If you would like to use something during Lent, if you don't already have some kind of devotion or guide to use. Um, anything else that we can lift up? Some, <clears throat> some of those devotions are even for families and also some for children. All right, so some of those are for families and for children as well. So a little bit of variety there for you to choose from. Well, let's begin with our prelude. You follow along with the reading this morning. You have 
have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. Hitherto, if you have asked nothing in my name, ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. If you'll join in hymn number 472, Near to the Heart of God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise you. Lord, we honor and adore you for this day, for holding us throughout the night, and for allowing us to wake to a new day of gladness, of service, and celebration. Lord, your blessing upon us through Christ Jesus, 
is a totally unmerited blessing and gift of your grace and profound love. We thank you for the mystery of calling us and choosing to offer us life and hope and joy. We ask that as we continue to live in your love, that we would be responding to the guidance and direction of your word and your spirit as you call us to love others as we are loved. We do lift the Doran family and friends, folks from our congregation who hold her dear in their hearts. We thank you that, Lord, we can entrust our loved ones to your eternal and perfect care. We pray that you would bring comfort and strength in the days ahead. We ask your continued blessing upon those who are ill, asking for your spirit to work in them with and around them through any medical care they may be receiving to bring healing and strengthening. We continue to praise you for what appears to be improvement, and we give thanks for things starting to improve in this battle with COVID-19. We pray for safety in the schools, especially with increasing activity in the enjoyment of those extracurriculars, that there will continue to be safety, and that the goodness and gladness that is shared in these celebrations would truly be a great joy to family and friends. We're grateful, O oh God, for your mercy and favor that continues to strengthen us as your church. To remember that our reason for being is because Jesus has given us life and has called us to be his presence in the world today. Help us to continue to share the good news, to seek to encourage others to come to know your saving love and mercy, and to accept the transformed life that Jesus gives us each day. Lord, these and many other things that are upon our hearts that we have named before you, we bring in the wonderful name of Jesus, who has taught his church to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. us 
gladness and willingness to sacrifice and share what we have in order to bless others. Being able to celebrate a, a day like the Super Bowl and to take that as a means of sharing how we can, through the simple act of sharing cans of soup, bring joy and gladness to others. Through simple acts of giving of our extra wealth, be able to bless folks who are going through what may be challenging or fearful times at this stage in their life by supporting Hope Pregnancy Center. And just being able every day to rejoice and be glad that there have been folks who have shown us the love of Jesus. And so we desire to continue to share the love of Jesus ourselves. We pray that you would be honored and glorified through our gifts this day and always in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask this. Amen.
Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said all these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, that is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that the, a child was born into this world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language but will tell you plainly about my father. Oh, I went too far. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your word. So you're right, you melt marshmallows, anything else that you mix in there? Water. 
Butter. Yeah. And then once you do all of that, they stick together. Have you ever had just regular Rice Krispies? Cereal? Rice Krispies? It doesn't stick together, does it? Uh, sells all over the place if you turn it over, right? But when you put some marshmallows, some butter, and some heat, it all sticks together, doesn't it? Yeah. And that doesn't change. The Rice Krispie treat, whether it's if you heat it up a little bit, like it gets warm on a sunny day, it's kind of mushy, right? But it still sticks together. Or even on a cold day, it'll stick together. And it reminds me of what we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes, about God's Holy Spirit that Jesus has promised to give us. We don't maybe understand everything that God's Spirit does, but it helps us to stick with Jesus and stick with so when you look at a rice crispy treat, maybe you can remember that just like those marshmallows and butter help to keep the rice krispies stuck together. God's Spirit helps you and me and other Christians stay together in the church. So let's see. Do I have four of these? Yes, I do. And um, even though this is not Super Bowl, this is Super Bowl, excuse me. You know, I am not a Super Bowl quarterback, so <laughs> I don't know if I can manage to get this up there. Uh, oh! 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 Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for simple ways that we can remember that you, the power of your spirit, and yes, even the fires of challenge and tribulation will bind us together and to keep us strong. We pray that you would continue to stir up in us your joy and gladness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pam, for sharing the scripture this morning. If you have your Bibles, at home or your Bible's here with you, I would encourage you to turn to John 16 as we take a few moments to think about what Jesus is telling us, offering us, and empowering us today. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do give you thanks that your words have been given to us through Generations of believers, those who have been used by you and the power of your spirit to impart to others wisdom and the truth, revelation of your good news to us. We thank you that your words of scripture are inspired by you, meaning that they are worthwhile us spending time being enlightened and taught encouraged, corrected by you. Also that we can be equipped to be the men and women that you have created us to be, to serve and honor you and to serve others. So we ask for your peace and your strength today in Jesus' name. Amen. In reflecting on the scriptures over the last few weeks, you know that uh, I've mentioned that a lot of the scriptures we've shared for me uh, are often stirred up in memory through song, uh, ways of simply connecting those things together. One of those songs, uh, last week we sang the his banner over me, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. And, and there are many other verses that you can sing with that that are taken from Scripture. But another one that actually kind of bridges over a couple of these portions of John's Gospel uh, starts out with words from what we were looking at last week in John 15. Uh, 
where Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will. It shall be done for you. And the second part of it, as I learned it, is based from today's text in verse 24. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask that you might receive and your joy may be full. And it goes something like this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. God's Spirit, according to what Jesus is telling us. You go back to John 14. You might remember, as Jesus talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit, that the Father was going to send in His name, the Spirit was going to come to be our Counselor. And as our Counselor, he would teach us and he would remind us of those things that we would be taught. In today's text, as Jesus is talking about the counselor coming, he says, you would be glad that I go away, for if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. And if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convince the world concerning, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I'd like to encourage you to think for a few moments about those specific works of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promises us the Spirit will do in all of our lives. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, if we are open to the ongoing work of God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will, as he said earlier, be our counselor, our advocate, the one who comforts us, who continues to remind us of things we've already been taught, who continues to teach us the things we yet need to know, which is a tremendous promise, because it's one that reminds us that that is a never-ending source of joy and comfort and love that holds us together. I'm talking with a few moments earlier about the Rice Krispie Tree, even, even far beyond the Rice Krispie Tree, held together by God's presence with us that we are assured never fails us, no matter what we're going through. There's some specific things about what that means to be able to be held in connection with Jesus as the Spirit's work is described by our Lord today. The first is the Spirit works to convince some translations use the word convict, but to make us know for sure about sin. Why? Most of us might think, why in the world would we need that? Very aware of our sin. But is that true for all? One of the challenging parts of this text, Jesus is talking about the importance of his coming to the world and bringing light so that we might see and know our need for his salvation, his deliverance, his mercy. Perhaps you've had moments in your life. There certainly are among us folks who do have those moments when we deceive ourselves or are deceived by other forces around us to believe that Everything is perfectly fine with us, without Jesus. I remember being shocked by an encounter with an individual in the church many years ago, who in the Sunday school class uh, declared to the group that was gathered there, she had never sinned. She didn't know why this talk about sin was so important. 
And as I heard that, I was honestly rather dumbfounded. So I didn't understand how she could believe that she had never sinned. That she would make such a statement openly. Being somewhat familiar with the reality that her life experience included being involved in an extramarital affair which led to the failure of a marriage. Even though she did end up marrying the man herself. I was quite aware that there were some family members who would disagree with her. But reading through this text, as I remembered that circumstance and experience, I also remembered this woman had not been raised in church, had not been raised in a godly home, was very unfamiliar with the scriptures. was just beginning to learn about the necessity of the saving work of Jesus. And it helped to explain part of what Jesus is talking about in this text. He talks about how those who have not yet heard might believe that they have no sin. Yet we live in a world where we're reminded plainly in our daily interactions that there is. That as much as we might try and strive to live a life that is right and true for ourselves and for those that we have relationships with, we're not able to do that perfectly through our own devices. As you remember from some of the texts we looked at already working through John. In John 2, at the very end of that chapter, we have Jesus reminding us that's why he came. That he was familiar with the reality of what humanity is like. And that as a human, he could understand the temptations and the challenges. Yet, he came to bring us deliverance. We, we he encountered that in the call of Jesus to Nicodemus in the next part of John, in John 3. Inviting him to know that it is possible for a person to be born anew through faith in God. That the old person, as Paul would put it in talking to the church, the old person can be crucified through faith and a new person born in us the life that Jesus makes possible. We can be cleansed and purified through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the hope and the promise and the work of His Spirit. But it requires our willingness to be honest with ourselves and with God and with each other. The promise is that as the Spirit of God continues to work, to convince and convict us of sin, it's not because God desires to beat us down in subjection as worthless and hopeless, but just the opposite. Is leaping into the next part, the work of the Holy Spirit is that which is convincing and convincing us of righteousness. Underneath there 
It appears righteous. We have been given by God in Jesus Christ the appearance of righteousness, covering over. But it's not just an outward appearance. Because through the work of God's Spirit, that which has been put upon us is also placed within us. And that new life in Christ begins to refresh and renew and transform us so that that righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us becomes our identity in Christ. And yes, we know that we have fallen. We are reminded of those times when we may sin. But we are also convinced by God's Spirit that we have righteousness in Jesus Christ. That we have been born anew to newness and life and goodness in Jesus. And so within the church, though there are always those moments when we need to come in confession, seeking forgiveness, reconciliation with God and with one another, we always must be sure that we hear the work and the promise of God's Spirit calling us to receive that which is right and holy and true, which Jesus gave his life to accomplish for us. In the life and ministry of our Savior, it's a reminder that Jesus did not only die on the cross. He did died on the cross for the sin of all humanity. <coughs> but Jesus also rose, was raised in glory in the resurrection, in power and holiness, in purity and in might. To continue the mysterious and transforming, awe-inspiring work of God be accomplished so that you and I and all of humanity might be restored to the relationship God created us to have from the very beginning. The relationship of life, of eternity, purpose, and holiness. And the third aspect of that work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus mentions here is the Spirit comes and is present and active in our lives, convicting, convincing us of judgment. That God is holy and true. That, yes, as a God who knows our sin, who offers forgiveness, God is still a God of righteous judgment. Though it is God's plain and obvious intention declared throughout salvation history, that we would come to him in faith, receive his promises in faith of life and relationship. If we refuse, God allows us to reap that which we have determined to sow. In Revelation, the last part of our New Testament, there's some strong reminders of this. One of the visions that we see in Revelation is the refusal of many to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and the judgment, the wrath that they bring upon themselves. In Revelation 6, the kings of the earth, the great men, and the generals, the rich and the strong, and everyone slave and free, hid in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand before it? The true and righteous judgment of God is not set aside. And if we refuse, if we insist on our own goodness or the 
lack of necessity of coming to God and receiving this incredible mercy and covenant of life and God. We bring upon ourselves that experience of being in the presence of God, which all will, but without the righteousness, the forgiveness, and the life that Jesus gives us. And that is indeed a terrible thing. We're reminded of God's patience and judgment a little bit later in Revelation. As one of the images is the vision of the great throne room of heaven and tells us that before the altar are the souls of those who have been persecuted and killed for the faith that they have in Jesus Christ. And they're crying out to God, how long must we wait? How long before judgment comes? And they are given robes of righteousness and told to wait a little longer. You see, God's judgment is not our judgment. God's judgment is far more merciful, far more patient, far more gracious. Because God's judgment is true. And as much as we strive for judgment to be true in our own hands, in our own minds, outside of the work of God's Holy Spirit and the guidance of God's Word, it is not. And yet we're told by Jesus the wonderful gift of the Spirit. Along with the convincing of sin, the convincing of righteousness, is the convincing that we can trust God to do that which is pure and holy and true and right. And to be amazed that as God does that, He does that with awe-inspiring mercy, patiently, tenderly, allowing us opportunities to know his favor and his goodness. In the words of what our Lord Jesus is calling us to here in John chapter 16, as we call it, we're being reminded that this is not something that is an optional experience for folks. This is what Jesus intends for us to know. It's God's intent for us. As Jesus has been preparing his followers for the reality that they, we, we have the advantage, we know the whole story, they, they're in the middle of it. But he's preparing them for the reality that shortly he will be betrayed, shortly he will be crucified and laid in a tomb, and they will believe it's over with. He'll be gone, just as he says to them. In a little while, I'll not be with you. And yet, in a little while, I will be with you. We know that in a little while, three days, he was raised. And he was with them until the ascension. Forty days. And as he's preparing them for all of this, he's also promising us, as he promised them, that I'm going to give you the presence of God and the Holy Spirit that will always be with you. Always. Whether you're having a wonderful and glorious day and everything is going as you think it should, or whether we are grieving the death of someone we love. Or grieving what we sometimes think would be easier if it were death. A loved one going through a time and part of life experience where they're not the same person that they've always been because of the ravages of the manifestation of the fallenness of the flesh, and the mind, and the body. And yet, even then, Jesus promises us, the Spirit, His 
Holy Spirit is with us. The invitation from the promise of our Lord Jesus is the invitation for us to embrace, to open ourselves, to be willing to say, like another song chorus, come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, Holy Spirit. I want to invite you to prayerfully consider that right now. Let's pray. Gracious God Almighty, we thank you for your marvelous, mysterious work through your Son, our Savior. We thank you for your patience, the ongoing unfolding of your salvation history. Today we thank you as well for your invitation to us to receive from you the gift of your presence with us that will never fail us to save us, your Holy Spirit to be with us always, to accomplish these great works and more, to be our comforter, to be our advocate, to be our guide, our guardian, to be your presence convincing us always of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, to be the one who gifts us with spiritual gifts to empower us for ministry, bringing glory to you and sharing the gospel in our everyday lives among those whom we're called to serve. That it all hinges upon us being willing to open ourselves and say simply, Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, your power, and your glory. This we pray, gracious God, in your mercy and favor. Amen. This morning we celebrate as the church literally doing so in the celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion. We share in the promise of our Lord Jesus to be with us and to offer to us his grace and his mercy, his power and his spirit and that which binds us in the power of the Spirit as the church to be His presence in the world today. Would you hear these words again with me? This is from, as Paul shares in his letter to the church at Corinth, that we call 1 Corinthians 11. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you join with me as we pray together? Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the thoughts and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone things we should have done. And we have done things we should not have done. We know there is no wholeness or health in us. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Spare all those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore all who are penitent according to your promises. Declare to all humanity in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may from now on live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Pray. We do not presume to come to your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness. But in your many and great mercies, we are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, gracious Lord, 
to partake of this sacrament of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in the wisdom of life, may grow into his likeness, and may our Lord dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Blessed be you, Lord God Almighty. We thank you and honor you and adore you for your gift of life and salvation and the ongoing work of your Spirit among us. We do indeed, Lord, remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he was with his disciples, he shared with them in that final Passover meal, taking the bread, blessing the bread. He then said to them, This bread is my body broken for you. Take and eat it. Feed upon me in your hearts and be glad. And then later he took the cup and after he blessed it, he gave it to them and he said to them, this blood, this cup is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as you remember me and celebrate the new life I give. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your favor and ask that you would empower us through the presence of Christ in your Holy Spirit and through these elements of the bread and the cup that we might be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood for the salvation of our lives and of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your elements, the body of Christ, broken for us. blood of Christ shed for us. May the perfect and holy sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ offered to us for the complete salvation of our lives, the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit, restore, establish, and strengthen us that we might live faithfully for Him, sharing the glad and glorious good news of Jesus with those that we are privileged to serve. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Closing hymn of celebration, the Spirit of God descends upon my heart. <laughs>
day with gladness in the name of Almighty God. Go in the assurance of the fact of God's love for you, of Almighty God, our Father, of your faith in Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior, and full of the feeling and empowerment of God's Holy Spirit. And let us go in peace. Amen. Amen.